Um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, I'll try and keep this keep this a, a little bit shorter so we get, get back us uh, get us back on time. So um, I'm uh, Alistair Jones, uh, a senior data scientist at NHS Digital, uh, and today I want to talk about our uh, work on generating artificial healthcare data uh, and how this enhances patient privacy. And mainly, I really want to point you towards our recently published code base. So there's a, a link on screen. Um, and I'll talk more about what you'll find there uh, later in the presentation. So just uh, to give an overview of the talk, so I'll give everyone an idea of what NHS, uh, what NHS Digital is, if I can get my words out, uh, and particularly uh, kind of around how researchers and analysts uh, connect to the data that we, we hold. Um, this will set the scene for me to talk through artificial data, uh, what it is and, and the, the main benefits it will bring for patients, uh, users and, and the wider kind of organization and, and NHS. Uh, and the main focus of the talk is, is really on our artificial data generator. So this is our code base for, for generating artificial versions of NHS digital assets. And finally, towards the end of the talk, we just uh, look at uh, how we want to take this forward and hopefully open up some avenues for, for possible collaboration. So I'm aware that many of you will already know, but uh, I just want to briefly outline what NHS Digital does. Uh, so we're the national provider of information, data and IT systems for uh, commissioners, analysts and clinicians uh, in health and social care in England. So we're responsible for things like the NHS website, uh, the NHS app, uh, spine services that let data flow between trusts and NHS mail in the uh, within the uh, wider NHS uh, and and loads of other things. But um, NHS Digital is, is also uh, the custodian of England's national health and care data. Uh, so the data sets that we hold uh, range, uh, cover a range of different care settings. So from primary care, so GP data, to secondary care uh, hospitals and uh, to community and social care settings as well. Uh, and the key point is that none of this data is ours. We don't own any of it. It belongs to patients. So it belongs to, to you in the audience and it belongs to me. And, and so we need to treat it with the utmost care and respect whenever we interact with that data. So NHS Digital uh, provisions access to patient data uh, for a small number of approved researchers and clinicians uh, from kind of partnered institutions uh, in order to improve patient care and the NHS service as a whole. Access to this data is managed through the Data Access Request Service uh, or DARS. And naturally, NHS Digital is extremely protective of patient data. So these access requests are, are very thorough and can take a long time. So we're talking months, if not years, and they require a lot of uh, paperwork and, and approvals and a lot of effort uh, on all sides. So when uh, researchers come in to access that data from outside, they, they connect with the data through the trusted research environment. Um, and this is uh, a way to bring the researchers to our data uh, rather than sending it out to uh, to them. So we've, we've touched on that in previous talks today. Um, and obviously this is, is a much more secure way of doing it than, than sending out extracts. Prior to coming in to the TRE and accessing that data, uh, prospective users of the data have to rely on public facing documentation and data dictionaries. Um, and that's quite hard for them to, to really know what they're, what they're applying for and, and what it's going to look like when they get it. Um, and it's really difficult to answer kind of certain questions that they might be asked in those, those data access uh, requests. So around you know, data minimization, what fields do you need and, and how are you going to use them and what kind of questions are you going to ask about that data? So what if we could help these users out? What if we could give them something that looks like the data they're requesting uh, in an environment that's kind of similar to the, the TRE? Um, and would this help them understand what they're actually going to apply for and, and streamline this whole process for them? So this kind of brings us on to artificial data, and, and that's our answer to, to some of these questions. So artificial data 
gives users something that looks similar to real data. So it has a similar structure, so the same field names and data types, and broadly uh, the same univariate frequency distributions. But it's completely anonymous. So by design, uh, it lacks st uh, statistical relationships between fields, and it wouldn't be possible to perform uh, representative analysis or build statistical models that would transfer onto real data. And by doing this, we, we eliminate any risk to re-identification. So I know someone earlier showed, showed a nice slide from, uh, I think it's from the ONS, about the kind of spectrum of artificial data, uh, of, of a spectrum of synthetic data. So we're definitely towards the kind of low fidelity end of that spectrum. Um, we've actually stayed clear of the word synthetic data just because there is this kind of, it's open to, to a bit of misinterpretation and, and it can mean quite a lot of different things to different people. So we've kind of stuck with, with artificial data as, as the term we use. Now, who benefits from this? I know we've, we've touched on this in previous talks as well, but, but for us, there are two primary benefits. Uh, the first and probably the most important is the enhanced patient privacy that comes through uh, having access to artificial data. So artificial data helps minimize the amount of personal data that gets processed. Uh, and this obviously benefits patients. Um, artificial data promotes the use of, of real data only when it's absolutely necessary. The second benefit comes in the form of efficiency gains and, and burden reduction. So analysts and researchers will have quicker and easier access to something that looks like the data they're interested in so that they can kind of start uh, their project work, they can start developing their understanding, uh, building uh, analytical pipelines and, and uh, scaffolding code bases. And if they want to go and apply for real data, they could uh, use this data to inform their DARS applications. Um, and so this helps overall streamline that process for them. We as an organization also benefit from both of these things. First and foremost, we've got a duty of care to our patients uh, to minimize the processing of their personal data whenever possible. Uh, and we benefit from the efficiency savings by having a smaller number of well-informed uh, DARS applications that will be easier for us to process. So I just want to give a quick example of, of the type of data that we, we generate. So we've already touched on, uh, or some, some of the previous presentations have touched on uh, HES. So this is a data set of all the hospital events that occur in England. Um, it's one of the largest and mostly, most widely used data sets that uh, NHS Digital holds. Um, and the key, key thing here is it, it's event-based. So patients can, can kind of reappear multiple times um, where each record represents a distinct event in a hospital setting, so a diagnosis, an admission, a treatment, or, you know, and so on. I've shown an example of, of a cut of our artificial data at, at the bottom of the screen, uh, and I don't know how it looks on the on the big screen in the uh, in real life, um, but I just want to point out a few features uh, of this data. So firstly, there's uh, some features that make it immediately clear that it's actually artificial data, like uh, the, the HES IDs, which uh, index unique patients, all begin with test. Uh, and that's just to show that there's, there's no overlap with, with any real IDs. No, no real IDs ever appear in this data. There are some more interesting features, though. So, so if you can see rows one to four, uh, they all share the same HES ID. And so do rows five to seven. And so what we have is, is patients that reappear in this data across time, uh, or seem to reappear. We've got the IDs arranged in such a way that they do. And we've also got patient characteristics that, that stay the same over time. So when we, when we resample from these patients, uh, they come back and they, they likely have a similar set of characteristics. But that's not always the case. We've, we've actually accounted for errors in this, in this data as well. Um, so you can see in, in row two, there's a different date of birth from the, from the other rows for that patient. And what we want to really do is, is produce this anonymous data, but still give users a flavor of what the real data is going to look like. You know, data sets aren't perfect and there's all sorts of weird things that can happen. Uh, and we want to kind of represent that. So on to kind of the, 
the main focus, I want to talk about the artificial data generator itself and, and what it does. So on this slide, I've got a, a kind of high level logic uh, of, of that. Um, so the first step is the metadata scraper. And this collects anonymous aggregates of real data on a column by column basis. So we take values for non-identifiable fields. So we th throw all of the IDs away. Uh, so only non-identifiable fields are aggregated to produce univariate frequency distributions. So essentially, we build a load of histograms. And no statistical relationships between fields are preserved. So we'd know, for instance, how many males there are in a data set and how many 50-year-olds there are. But we wouldn't know how many 50-year-old males there are. Uh, and small numbers are suppressed to ensure that this data is anonymous. So following this, uh, we have a data generator step that randomly samples from this metadata, again on a column by column basis. It essentially picks a value for each field and sticks those values together to make something that looks like real record, a real record. And then we just do that a lot of times. And then we stick some, uh, some dummy kind of IDs on the end from based on a template pattern. Um, no actual values appear for, for any ID fields, as I said. And then finally, we just apply some basic tweaks to this data to make it appear more realistic. So we swap birth and death dates to make sure they're kind of ordered correctly. So generating data in this way leads to artificial data that's, that's anonymous uh, and has the kind of right structure and uh, univariate frequency distributions. Um, but it also lacks record level integrity. So yeah. I think someone gave the example earlier and, and they actually gave the same example that, that I'm going to give, which is you, you could have, uh, or I think it was a similar example, uh, you could have geriatric diagnosis codes by pediatric patient records and vice versa. You, you, or you could have, I think it was a 95 year old man uh, with a, a postnatal uh, diagnosis, a postnatal depression diagnosis. So um, yeah, it's, it's, that, that kind of describes the, that kind of uh, that lack of record level integrity. We do also have a way to generate artificial data tables and make it look like they're related to each other. So if you generated multiple tables, you'd have IDs that you could carry over. And so what you'd be able to do with those is you'd be able to, to take two artificial data tables and join them and get a similar number of records before and after that join. Um, but the referential integrity wouldn't stretch beyond that. I'm not really going to talk more about how that works here, um, but if you're interested, then then please feel free to to reach out to me after the talk and, and we can go through it. Now, here I want to just look at some of the features we've put in place to ensure that the artificial data is completely anonymous uh, and how we provide that assurance that there's been no accidental disclosure of personal information via the metadata that we create. So the metadata scraper gets run in a separate environment for each data set that it interacts with. So on screen, you can see that data set one uh, sits in a completely different scope to data set two, and there's no uh, interference between those scopes. Nothing can bleed between the two. So everything is completely isolated from one another. So we produce the aggregates of data set one in its own environment and the aggregates of data set two in its own environment and so on. And once we've done that, we've then put in place uh, a checklist based on consulting with our chief statistician and the disclosure control panel at NHS Digital. And so what happens is a member of NHS Digital staff who is approved to access real data reviews that metadata against the checklist and gets sign off from a senior manager. And this is similar to how NHS Digital releases to, uh, stats publications, and it helps provide that assurance that the aggregated data is in fact anonymous. Um, so we expect that it should be based on the code we've written, but we put that check in place to give it that sign off. After the metadata has been approved in that environment, we move it into a different environment uh, where it can be fed into the data generator. So the data generator is completely isolated from any record level data. It never gets to see it and records don't get fed into the data generator at all. Only metadata that has been signed off through this process. 
So here, I mean, I, I guess this is kind of the main point of, of the talk. I don't want to dive in, into any, any code in any detail, but I just want to point you towards the code base that we've, uh, we've recently published. So this is what we use to generate artificial data. And we've been working to put this code out in the open for a while uh, with this talk in mind. Uh, unfortunately, we managed to get it out earlier this week. So um, you'll be able to find it at the first link shown on screen uh, or on our organization GitHub. I want to quickly highlight as well just the second link uh, on screen, which details the process that we've uh, agreed with our senior leadership uh, within the organization for putting code in the open. So we've got a review and sign off process in place that teams need to complete uh, before they release code to ensure that nothing risky is included in the repo. So please take a look at that link as well uh, if you're interested in publishing your code uh, or reach out to us and we'd be happy to talk you through it. But just back to the code base. Um, so we've developed the code uh, in Python, so hence the, the PyCom uh, strand. Uh, and this leverages the PySpark API to, to aggregate big data sets and generate large volumes of artificial data in a scalable way. And partly this design is down to the fact that we use Databricks at NHS Digital. So if, if you've not used it before, Databricks is a cloud-based platform for, for working with Spark primarily. But this design also uh, allows us to match the scale of real data sets and the artificial data we generate. So for instance, data engineers might be able to use this data for volume testing, where previously they might have had to use either real data or completely kind of garbage fake data. So we're now giving kind of catering for that use case. Again, I don't want to delve too much into kind of code and implementation details in this talk, but if you're interested, then, then reach out to us after. Um, I do want to highlight a few of the technical requirements and constraints we've been working within. Um, so previously I said, you know, we've, we want to completely isolate the aggregation step uh, from the generation step, and we want to insert a manual review process in between these two. So to implement these requirements, we've implemented, uh, well, we've used a framework that uh, our platform developers provide to analyt analytical staff at NHS Digital, and that's called co-promotion. And essentially, this is a way to bundle up data pipelines uh, into something called projects. So a project encompasses everything you'd need to build and run a data pipeline. So all the code, the tests, the uh, description of the databases, the, the jobs, everything. Um, and so using HES as an example, we've got four of these projects, each of which tackles a different aspect of the problem we're, we're, faced, uh, we're, we're faced with. So the first deals with scraping the metadata from HES. The second uh, is used to administrate that metadata, so move it into the safe environment if, if it is deemed safe to do so. A third is used to generate the artificial data from the safe metadata. And then a final one is used to present that artificial data to users. And each of these projects only has access to, to a set kind of permission scope. So only the metadata scraper step interacts with real data. And the, the data generator step only ever interacts with approved metadata. So I just want to kind of set some expectations for if you went to this code base and, and you had a look around, just set some expectations for how you might be able to use this or, or more precisely what kind of the limitations are. Um, so we have developed this entirely in Databricks and in its current form, it will only work in Databricks. So code is written in Databricks notebooks, so it doesn't work like usual Python files. Um, and that's not to say that isolated kind of functionality uh, wouldn't work. So if you had your own PySpark and Python environment, you'd be able to copy the code into, into there and, and use different bits of it. But the kind of pipelines and the file structure as a whole is designed for Databricks and, and would only work there. So this means things like, you can see on line 22, in, importing code in Databricks is a bit weird. Uh, you use this kind of magic run command. And the Python interpreter in a, in a non-Databricks environment wouldn't know what that means. So you'd, you'd struggle uh, kind of downstream from that. 
So unfortunately, we've kind of had to be pragmatic um, and work within the constraints of the environment and the tools that we've we've been given. Um, but we do have plans to extract the reusable logic uh, out of our code base into its own package um, so that people could reuse this across uh, environments. And I'll touch, touch again on this shortly. So a big uh, kind of elephant in the room uh, that I've been ignoring thus far is can you access the artificial data and how so? And at the moment, the answer is no. Um, unfortunately, access is restricted to internal NHS digital systems uh, only. Um, well, so I say no. So if you are an internal analyst uh, at NHS digital, you can access it through the data access environment. Or if you're an external researcher from a partnered institution, you can, you can access it via the, the trusted research environment. But the reasons for, for this kind of restriction on access are, are historical and complex, and, and I don't really want to go into it. Um, we know that the artificial data is anonymous, as it's defined by GDPR. And we strongly believe that the real value of this data uh, comes when you make it publicly available. So we're currently working with our information governance colleagues to gain the approvals we need to put this data in the open. And that will probably be via the NHS digital website. So we're hoping to have this within the calendar year, but uh, watch this space and, and we'll keep, keep people updated. In terms of where we want to take the code base, um, there's kind of two sides to it. Uh, so we've got approval to produce artificial data for what I can do is I just finish on this link. Um, if anyone wants to reach out to us, then please, uh, we've got some uh, email addresses on screen. Uh, so get in touch and we can talk to you about it uh, offline, I think. Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm sorry I've, I've overrun a bit. Um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the sessions.